Okay, sorry for the slow start today. We have one more participant who's trying to dial in, I know right now. If you are here for today's event on uh, human rights and accountability for Israel-Palestine, you are in the right place. Um, we're going to give this just a few more seconds to let people join us in our Zoom room, and then we'll get started, and hopefully our additional participant will be able to join us. Uh, he's dialing in from Ramallah. So we'll, we're going to start at exactly three minutes after the hour. It's time to grab yourself a coffee. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to start with the introductions and uh, hopefully Shawan can join us. Um, so good morning or good afternoon and welcome to the third session of our six part congressional briefing series Israel Palestine key issues for the 118th Congress. I'm Laura Friedman I'm president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm very pleased to be co hosting the series with Khalil Gindi, who is director of the Middle East Institute's program on Palestine and Palestinian Israeli affairs. Thanks, Laura. So today's session is uh, human rights and accountability, in which we'll be talking about the human rights conditions in Israel and the occupied territories as they relate to both Palestinian, uh, both to the Israeli government and Palestinian political actors uh, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, as well as the broader question of accountability. So to help us uh, better understand these issues, we've lined up a really excellent um, panel uh, of experts. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly here, and you can find their full bios uh, on the landing pages for uh, for this event. So first, we have uh, Francesca Albanez, uh, who is the U United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory Occupied Since 1967. Uh, next, we have uh, Rabia Erberia, uh, who is a PhD candidate at Harvard Law School and an expert on the Israeli legal system. And he's also affiliated with uh, the uh, Israel-based uh, group Adela. Uh, and uh, third, we have Shawan uh, uh, Jabarin, uh, director of Al-Haq, the oldest and largest human rights organization in Palestine. Um, as I said, you can, you can see their full bios on, on our landing pages. Um, our colleagues will be putting in their Twitter handles and other relevant resources throughout our discussion. So keep an eye on the chat box for those. Uh, and of course, if you miss anything in the chat, don't worry about it. All of these materials will be posted on the website. And of course, you can always uh, also come back and watch the recording. So uh, I'll just quickly say the format for the session, like all of these sessions in the series, is a moderator Q moderated Q&A, which is led by myself and Khaled. Um, we welcome questions from our participants, which are anonymous, so you don't have to worry if you want to ask a question, but want to be anonymous, it is. Um, you can put those in the chat box, or sorry, in the Q&A box at any time during the discussion. We'll be watching the Q&A box, um, and we'll try to get to any questions that are in there. Finally, I want to note this webinar is being recorded. Um, also, if you have any technical questions, put those in the chat box. Our colleagues behind the scenes will take care of those. So with that, let's get things started. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Francesca, I'd like to start with you uh, and, and ask you to help kind of um, paint the picture for us of the, of the human rights landscape that we're talking about. The human rights situation in the occupied territories is complicated in that there's more than one uh, political actor operating in the area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Uh, first, of course, we have the state of Israel, which under international law is the occupying power uh, in the West Bank, um, where uh, for decades it has been uh, building settlements uh, and, and other unilateral action in violation of international law, and which many see as a form of de facto annexation uh, by Israel. Um, here, I think it's important to note that just yesterday, the, the new Israeli government uh, of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu um, took a pretty unprecedented step in, in terms of its relationship with the West Bank by transferring uh, authorities that had been under the Israeli military to a civilian authority, namely the Ministry of Finance. 
um, which uh, many people, I think le many legal experts uh, see as not just a form of de facto annexation, but actually de jure or formal annexation uh, as well, even without a formal declaration. Um, Israel uh, is also uh, under international law, the occupying power in East Jerusalem, uh, which uh, was under Israeli law annexed in 1980. And it is, uh, I think, also uh, widely considered to be the occupying power uh, in the Gaza Strip as well. Uh, even though Israeli forces have, uh, have quit the Gaza Strip in 2005, they still maintain effective control uh, over Gaza. Uh, then we have also Palestinian actors, in particular the Palestinian Authority, uh, which has limited um, uh, authority or jurisdiction in parts of the West Bank. And we also have a parallel authority operating in the Gaza Strip uh, under uh, Hamas. So with all of this as context, um, uh, Francesca, can you tell us what is the legal regime that applies in, in the occupied territories? Uh, what are Israel's responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians? What are the laws governing uh, the presence of Israeli settlers? Uh, and what are the obligations also uh, under international law of Palestinian actors like the Palestinian Authority and Hamas when it comes to both Israelis and Palestinians? Uh, good morning, everyone in the US. And I would also like to salute um, uh, Lara and Khaled and my fellow panelists today. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to help um, with uh, setting the scene. Uh, of course, within the limits of my mandate, primarily, because as the Special Rapporteur on the um, human rights situation in the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, my mandate only covers the territories that Israel has occupied as of 1967, the West Bank is Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. But of course, I will also provide some, some elements concerning Israel, I mean, all Palestinians under Israeli rule. Um, I would like to, to, to say something because it's important to clarify the difference between the, the, the jure and, and de facto annexations. For 55 years of blossoming of colonies that today are 270 in the, in the occupied Palestinian territory, and they host over 750,000 illegal settlers wrapped in bubbles of Israel's extra extraterritoriality, um, the Palestinians uh, under occupation have been plunged in the limited territory that remains to them, where they are supposed to enjoy an independent and sovereign state into physical confinement, the discriminatory uh, law enforcement. So it's, um, and East Jerusalem, East Jerusalem is considered annexed by Israel as of the 80s. So I don't think that the move that Smotrich um, and uh, is, is, is part of, uh, is, is really new, is really unprecedented. And also every colony represents a bubble of Israeli extraterritoriality, a bubble of application of international, uh, sorry, of Israeli law. So there, we, there are patches of annexations that have been ongoing for, for 55 years. And again, this is not the outcome of a bomb of the bombastic arrival of an extremist government to power. This is the result of 55 years of acquisitive, repressing, and segregationist policies um, implemented by successive Israeli governments. And as um, the journalist, Israeli journalist Amira As says, even left-wing governments have been military juntas for the Palestinians. Now, going to your to your question, um, Khaled. Um, so in Israel. Everyone, um, Palestinians with Israeli citizens and Jewish Israeli citizens are Jewish Israeli citizens are under the same domestic law and civil administration, but with differences because there are many uh, restrictions um, for the Palestinians who are not recognized as a real minority in the country. But as I said, this is outside the scope of my mandate. Let me focus on the reality in the, in the OPT. Occupied Palestinian territory, which under international law is considered occupied and therefore um, international humanitarian law applies and human rights law applies, especially because over 55 years, a regime like that of international humanitarian law, the law of war and the law of occupation cannot be considered as the sole legal compass because this, the IHL, international humanitarian law, is supposed to be temporary and not to regulate civil life 
uh, over 55 years. But however, as an occupying power, so under IHL, Israel is, um, is obliged to res respect and ensure public order and civil life without changing as far as possible the law in force at the time the occupation has started and uh, ensure the protection, particularly the protection of children, the, the maintenance of hospitals, the protection, preservation of natural resources, and the insurance of access of the protected population, the occupied population, to every essential services, particularly medical supplies and food. Um, IHL also uh, creates some obligations for the occupying power who cannot, uh, um, who cannot impose collective punishment, pillaging. Surely it cannot annex the occupied territory. This is considered so illegal. There are, there are no legal consequences that are recognized. And, uh, and of course, in enforcing the law to maintain, to maintain public order and life, Israel is obliged to observe um, human rights law. So to, to respect all human rights and protect all human rights of the people under occupation. Now, there are also, of course, the Palestine, there is the Palestinian Authority, or controlling the West Bank and Hamas controlling de facto Gaza. Um, they are, of course, duty bearers under human rights law vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, but they cannot be considered a party. They, they, I mean, this doesn't take away the responsibilities that Israel has under, under IHL or under human rights law. Because, uh, and with this I conclude, they are part of a government in captivity. How can a government function independently while remaining subjugated without enjoying full jurisdiction over the whole of its territory, citizens? and resources. So this is the, the, the situation in the OPT at the moment. Thank you, Francesca, for a very thorough <laughs> opening section. I think there's it's very helpful. But Rabia, I want to turn to you. And, and Francesca just laid out the legal situation, de facto, and the legal context for it as relates to human rights in the occupied territories. I want to shift the focus to Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, who, in theory, these are these are Palestinians who live within Israel's borders. So these are the 48 borders, um, and who enjoy, in theory, all the same protections and rights as Jewish citizens of Israel. Yet, who face specific human rights challenges under Israeli laws, from various kinds of discrimination. This is systemic and systematic. Uh, to last year's Supreme Court ruling allowing Israel to strip the citizenship of people for uh, breaches of loyalty. Um, and then you have the Palestinians of East Jerusalem, who Francesca alluded to, Israel has annexed East Jerusalem and the status of Palestinians living there. And these are people, many of whose families have been there since long before the creation of the state of Israel, um, who now are have the, the status under Israeli law of residents. Um, and as residents, they are treated basically as foreigners who moved there um, via Israel's magnanimity and who enjoy um, no rights, but enjoy revocable privileges. So can you talk about this human rights, the, the status and the, the, the human rights situation for Palestinians living inside what we call the Green Line um, and inside East Jerusalem? Yes, thank you, Laura. Um, I think, you know, the starting point would be given exactly Francesco what 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 said I mean the, the, the context that we cannot really understand the situation, whether in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, or um, Palestinian citizens of Israel without looking at this, you know, broader context and placing it all together. These are all, you know, different Palestinians living under different legalities. Each of them hold different ID cards, um, are designated as, um, you know, different um, uh, um, statuses, legal statuses. So there is a system, in fact, of legal fragmentation of Palestinians, according, uh, among other things, territory, as we see. So these fragments, and here we intersect my uh, question and, and Francesca's question, because East Jerusalem, for example, uh, are residents of Israel, and the, 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 the territory is annexed to Israel, as Francesca also mentioned, um, but they are also, according to international law, considered an occupied territory. And, and here we start seeing the complication of this Israeli system of legal fragmentation. Now, as I want, having said that, I want to focus on these two 
fragments, the Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem. The key to understanding um, the status of citizens is understanding that Palestinian citizens are not nationals of uh, the state, right? There is a bifurcation between the citizenship concept and the nationality concept in Israel. In fact, the Israeli Supreme Court back in the 70s already has ruled that there is no uh, such thing, legally speaking, as Israeli nationality. There is only Jewish nationality. Now, this complicates our understanding because usually these two concepts are, um, that are synonymous, citizen and a national. Once you're a citizen, you're a national of the nation state, right? But in Israel, there is this two-tiered citizenship that is enshrined in, uh, in law uh, that distinguishes between a citizen and a national. Now, what that means is that there is, um, you know, dozens of laws that apply and discriminate between these two groups, right? The group of Palestinian citizens and the group of Jewish Israelis. Uh, Adala, the, the organization I'm affiliated with, um, has documented and maintains a database that documents over uh, 60 laws that discriminate or create a disparate impact against Palestinian citizens uh, of Israel. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the law that has been greenlighted by um, the Israeli Supreme Court in 2021, the Zayud case, uh, which allows revocation of citizenship. So there is what we understand is that there's already this system of legal statuses and classification of Palestinians allows downward legal mobility without effectively allowing upward legal mobility. So if you're a citizen, you can be downward, downgraded basically to a resident status or, uh, and most recently as of last week, this law has been expanded to also allow deportation of Palestinian citizens after their, the revocation of their citizenship. This can happen, just to mention, uh, if the so-called uh, the, the court determines that um, there is um, a breach of loyalty, which is not exactly uh, defined by the law to, for example, it's not necessarily tied to a criminal procedure to a limited, very limited number of cases. So having said that scene you know, of understanding the legal status, you know, zooming in into Palestinian citizens of Israel is uh, we, we have to understand that the Palestinian citizens com comprise about 20% of, uh, of the population in Israel. And yet they live, for example, on only 3% of the land. This is a major issue. Uh, the, the land discrimination, in fact, discrimination pertains to almost every domain you can think of. Land, housing, allocation of budgets and resources, um, and, and more. Um, there are Palestinian unrecognized villages in the Naqab, uh, the, the Bedouin unrecognized villages, over 35 of them where you do not even have access to water and basic infrastructure uh, provided by the state. The state, in fact, has not built a single Palestinian locality since 1948. So it becomes clear that the situation is, um, is a situation of deep and entrenched and systemic uh, discrimination that amounts to um, uh, domination of the Palestinian population with Israel citizenship. Um, now, having said that, I just want to briefly say something about the resident status which of East Jerusalem, which is, again, a downward uh, the, uh, it's it's in this tier or hierarchy of legal statuses, you can think of the citizens as the most expansive tier uh, of rights, while residents are even downgraded from, uh, downgraded from that tier with even more limited movement rights uh, and uh, residency revocation of, 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 of the residents of East Jerusalem. Um, so since then, the, uh, um, the residency revocation can occur if uh, something called the center, based on the center of life clause, which basically uh, allows the ministry to revoke residency um, if someone moves out of East Jerusalem or the territory of Israel proper, um, for example, including to the West Bank. Um, now, having said that, the, the situation in uh, Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, um, is not only about the residency revocation, there is a hyper-militarization that uh, Palestinians experience in East Jerusalem with the wall cutting um, also the neighborhoods of East Jerusalem and creating even a further in, uh, fragmentation and uh, um, a bifurcation of the territory um, with checkpoints, police forces, militarized police forces, and intense Judaization 
policies that amount to ethnic cleansing. Thanks, Rabia. Uh, Shawen, I, I'd like to turn to you and ask you to uh, paint a picture for us um, as the head of Palestine's uh, largest uh, human rights organization, and frankly, one of the oldest in the Arab world, um, Al Haq. It, could you um, give us a sense of the human rights situation on the ground currently, uh, particularly as you know, uh, in uh, we, we've seen a major surge in violence over the past year, especially um, 2022 was the deadliest year for Palestinians uh, in the West Bank since 2005, with something more than or almost 200 Palestinians killed. Uh, and, and 2023 is already shaping up to be even deadlier, uh, with uh, around 65 Palestinians killed uh, so far, including 13 children since the start of the year. Um, just a, a few days ago, 11 Palestinians were killed during an Israeli army raid into the city uh, of Nablus. Um, what are the most serious threats to, to, to human rights uh, in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the current context that, uh, uh, that you see uh, for Palestinians in the occupied territories? Uh, thank you, Khaled, and uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be with you and also all of my colleagues and the panelists. <clears throat> Uh, I think the current environment is very uh, dire, and the sense uh, on the ground is that no matter how many words of condemnation, uh, the international community will not take the necessary steps to hold Israel accountable. The message that sends is we cannot rely on international law to protect us because there is no political will to enforce it. That means we are on our own to defend ourselves and resist against this apartheid regime and its <clears throat> colonial appetite that continues to feeding of Palestinians' blood. The most serious threat is the current regime that has no consideration for international public opinion, uh, removing any filter of self-restraint uh, and feeling uh, more em emboldened than ever. If less than a week after agreeing to de-escalation in order to avoid the Security Council resolution, it has announced the uh, construct uh, construction of hundreds of hundreds of settlements, housing units. Just you can imagine this: demolish the number of houses and most recently raiding the city of Nablus, killing 10, injured more over, over uh, 100. And one day later, it formalized the de jure annexation of Palestinian territory by placing dramatic new powers directly in the hands of minister in the Ministry of Defense. And a formal annexation, which the international community has constantly considered the red line, has been crossed. Unfortunately, the response has been mostly silence. This is part. And the raids on a daily basis, this is also a second, a killing. Just you can imagine these days in the occupied territory, people feeling that, feel that death and lives equal. This is, I think, a main danger thing, taking in my account that the Palestinian Authority lost its popularity. And even more than that, lost its, let me say, legitimacy in the eyes and the minds of the people. The people, they look at the Palestinian Authority as, you know, a, let me say, as not just as a tool in the hands of the Israelis, but it's like a subcontractor of the Israelis. This is how they look at them. This has killed every hope in people's minds. And this is the case, this is the situation. And because of that, you see the young generation, they are doing what they do. They, they, they don't believe about their leaders. They don't believe about any one. I would like to give you one just number. The Palestinians under 29 years old in the occupied territory, they are 76% of the population. Just you can imagine how this society is young. This is the case. Yesterday I was in Naples, 
I hear, you know, all of these things that I mentioned to you now, I hear it from the mouth of the people. Eyewitnesses, people in the street, because we deployed all of our field workers just to go to document and to get, you know, exact uh, situation on what's happened there. That's, that's the issue. This is the people, what they are saying uh, in the streets and uh, everywhere. I think it's a very, very difficult uh, moment and makes it more difficult is what the Israelis doing on a daily basis. Thank you. Thanks, Shawan. And, and I actually want to stay with you and I want to sort of shift to talking a little bit about accountability. And I, I was thinking while you were talking about the, the current um, situation in Nablus, there was a video, there's a video circulating online um, it's the, the end of the raid, the Israeli raid, and the Israeli jeeps are leaving, and you see two armored jeeps leave, and you see a third one start to leave, and then you see it turn. Um, it looks deliberate, maybe it was an accident, but just to plow into a crowd of people in the street. And, and I want to talk to you about accountability, because you know, there's videos circulating regularly of, of Palestinians and uh, actions against them by Israeli settlers, or whatever. Um, there isn't accountability. No, no one's ever held responsible in the Israeli public discourse. These are all terrorists. If you die, you're a terrorist. If you're a civilian, it's the terrorist's fault that the IDF had to kill you or whatever. I want to talk to you as someone who works on human rights documentation, human rights reporting, right? So human rights reporting is about identifying the who, the what, the where, the how of human rights violations. But the goal is ultimately to get accountability for those violations. Talk to us about why accountability is necessary. Um, or the flip side, talk about what is the impact of no accountability on the situation on the ground that you just very articulately described? Uh, look, Laura, the issue of accountability is simple logic and behavior psychology. Behavior rewarded is encouraged and behavior punished is disencouraged, discouraged. I don't need to explain the types of actions that can be taken to discourage behavior. Just look at what measures have been taken to address Russia's occupation of Ukrainian territory. With only today, 22 new sanctions were issued to mark one year of the recent invasion of Ukrainian territory. Palestinians have been living under occupation for over 55 years, and we are still waiting for one tangible measure of action to discourage Israeli behavior. Just one. This is, I think, where we are staying. This is the, the problem, what's going on uh, these days. Uh, okay, we sent, you know, I think the Palestinian case is the most documented cases in the world. And when it comes to the international crimes taking place here, is the most international case, you know, that was documented in all levels, in a very also international standards. And no one action was taken. No one actions. And I mean by actions, for instance, the uh, to uh, to sanctions, to, uh, let me say, to, uh, to hold the criminals accountable, even to have a list. The minimum, minimum, not to let even the criminals to get a free visa, for instance, to put them on blacklists. To that extent, we are looking at one small actions. If there is no actions, this is an encouragement of the criminals to continue their crimes. This is what we are seeing, you know, in our case in Palestine. Thanks, Shawan. Um, Rabia, I, I want to stick with this. Uh, I want to turn to you and, and stick, uh, stick with this uh, theme of accountability. We know that Israel um, has a whole range of unilateral tools at its disposal. They can, Israeli can, army can and often does arrest whoever it wants, can carry out what it calls targeted uh, killings or assassinations. 
Um, uh, it, it can detain large numbers of Palestinians, often without charge. Um, uh, and uh, it also has uh, considerable uh, capacity to impose various economic and other sanctions on uh, on Palestinians uh, and and their and their leaders and their institutions and so forth. But what about Palestinians? Um, it, I don't know if you uh, remember this, but back in early 2021, there was a famous exchange uh, between an American journalist, um, uh, Matt Lee of the Associated Press, and the State Department spokesperson Ned Price, in which uh, Matt Lee kept asking the question where should Palestinians go to get accountability? I think he asked the question of uh, the spokesperson something like 12 times and never really got uh, any sort of answer. And so my question to you is, where should Palestinians go to get any form of accountability? Well, Khaled, I think this is precisely the question that all victim, Palestinian victims of Israeli policies are constantly asking. Um, look, for example, at the case of uh, the, the Shirin Abu Aqli, the late journalist Shirin Abu Aqli, whose family is constantly asking for accountability. And so far, we haven't really seen any progress on that front. Um, and I think, you know, it is now clear after years and years with countless number of cases documented that the Israeli system is, is both unwilling and unable to prosecute or deliver justice to its victims. In fact, the Israeli system, especially you know the judicial system, um, ha has been complicit in legitimating and allowing these crimes to thrive and creating a culture of impunity. This is precisely what happens when you have no uh, ability for accountability domestically. Now, if we're talking about, you know, the international community, here is where the international community is supposed to kick in, right? Uh, you would expect that international forums would allow uh, seeking justice or paths. And there is mechanisms in place that supposedly allow that, right? The ICC, for example, the International Criminal Court is one path that allows seeking justice or prosecuting war criminals. But it is limited by its nature um, and it has, you know, jurisdiction, it's ruled already that it has jurisdictions over the, the OPT. It's limited by its nature for the individual prosecution and, and many other limitations. And we haven't de, de facto seen any um, um, uh, progress in that front as well recently, uh, but the question remains pending as of now, right? Uh, so, so the question of where do Palestinians seek accountability is really important to ask, and especially given that the US, for example, plays a major role in allowing this culture of impunity of Israel. The US, for example, has casted most, the absolute number of, of, of uh, most of its uh, veto power in favor of Israel. Uh, this is unimaginable. You know, when I heard this fact, I was really, um, yeah, I mean, thinking about it as, as the number of the majority of vetoes casted by the US were in favor of Israel. This tells you something about how this culture of impunity is maintained. The media as an institution is also complicit in this. I just want you to imagine, you know, a Palestinian going to Tel Aviv shooting or a group of Palestinians. Imagine a group of Palestinians going to Tel Aviv and shooting 10 people, injuring 100. The world would be, you know, filled with headlines for days talking about this issue, condemning this issue. Uh, we haven't seen this reaction. In fact, the, 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 the killing of Palestinians has been normalized uh, by the Israeli occupation, as has been the case in Nablus uh, and in Jenin, not very long ago as well. We have more than 60 Palestinians killed in 2023, and we're not yet two months in. Uh, this tells you all you need to know. And I, I wish I could have given a different answer about, you know, legal, uh, beautiful legal paths to, 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 uh, to secure accountability. But the situation is, in fact, that there is systemic lack of um, accountability and uh, that creates a culture of impunity. Thanks, Rabia. Francesca, I want to ask you a, a variation on that same question. Um, this question of accountability. I'm sorry, my dog is dreaming in the background. If you hear barking, that is that is him dreaming. Um, so Rabia talked about 
the International Criminal Court, which again, ha which has confirmed it does have jurisdiction to hear complaints about Israel, but so far it hasn't led to anything. You and your mission are about looking at these same things. Your mandate is looking at the, the situation. We have the Commission of Inquiry. We have all of these things. But the issue of accountability comes up over and over again. And generally the response I think that we hear from Israel, and I, I'm guessing people on the Hill hear this from their Israeli interlocutors is Israel's democracy, Israel has a justice system, Israel can investigate itself, and that's what should be respected. And the Biden administration has been largely deferential to that. I want you to talk about this idea. Why isn't Israeli self-investigation sufficient under international law as a starting point? And, and what do you think is the role of the ICC potentially, or, or you know, what, what can the ICC or international justice provide in terms of accountability going forward, or what it can't, can't it provide? Yeah, you know, um, we, we could spend the days to answer this question, but just to, to give you uh, some, some numbers that, that, that depict the situation and complement to what Rabia just said, that Israel has proven unwilling and unable to conduct transparent, thorough and independent investigations on the crimes that it commits that are daily committed against the Palestinians um, by Israeli forces and settlers alike. Only 2% of the complaints of soldiers' violence against Palestinians, 2% ends up in prosecution and of meaning are, are, are uh, assessed by a court. Um, and all of that 2%, 7% results in indictment. We are talking of crimes, as uh, Shawan was saying, that are heavily, massively uh, documented, uh, often video documented, and this is the results. And um, the, the, it, <laughs> on the other hand, Palestinians tried in Israeli military courts, which is problematic in itself because under international hum human rights law, um, it's uh, the, the military courts are considered inadequate um, to, to, to judge civilians, to try civilians. So in this already problematic situation, 99.6% of the Palestinians face, um, I mean, 99% of the Palestinians face convic a conviction. So again, these this numbers depict the, the, a situation which which corroborates the allegation that of discriminatory uh, of the discriminatory nature that uh, Israel uh, Israel maintains over the Palestinians. Now, going to the second part of your question, the role of the of the of the ICC. It's twelve years that the ICC has received. Um, um, I mean, that the, the uh, investigation of the ICC has been triggered. Six years to determine that there was. Um, that Palestine, that Palestine was entitled to file a case, and then, and then, six years to determine that there is jurisdiction. Now, as of 2021, we are waiting for the prosecutor to send its investigators, because there is no other way to ensure accountability in the form of carcerality. And in the form of carcerality, accountability is necessary, because it can be a deterrent for all those in power. At the same time, let me add two things. I don't think that accountability in the in the case of Palestine can only be delivered in the form of carcerality. There is a concept of justice at large, which includes reparations and cessation, cessation of the violation. So abiding by the law of state responsibility, cessation of violations, non-recognition of the illegal act and their consequences, and ensuring reparations. This is a large what is to be pursued. Um, I conclude by just saying that um, the ICC is undergoing a serious uh, legitimacy crisis uh, because of being seen as the court that only acts against uh, states in the global south. So the only case where this has not happened is Ukraine, but because there are the usual Western powers behind it. So I think that acting in on the case of Palestine is a way to restore that sense of legitimacy. And of course, there are also domestic courts that can prosecute crimes committed in the OPT, not only on the ground of universal jurisdiction, but, but also because many Israelis commit crimes which are documented 
have uh, uh, double nationality, nationalities from Europe and the US as well. Uh, thanks, Francesca. Um, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper in, into our discussion here and, and ask you, uh, Rabia, um, in, in recent years, human rights experts, including major international organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, as well as Israeli human rights groups uh, like B'Tselem and Yeshtin, have begun using the term apartheid uh, to uh, describe the reality that exists uh, in Israel and Palestine. Um, sometimes it, for, for some groups, it's in relation to uh, the areas that Israel occupies, the occupied territories. Uh, and for others, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's in, on both sides of, uh, of the green line um, as a, you know, based on this idea that it's a single regime. It's the same regime that operates in both, uh, in both places. Um, so there seems to be a kind of growing consensus among human rights defenders and human rights uh, uh, legal experts uh, about this characterization of apartheid in one form uh, or another. At the same time, this characterization uh, of apartheid has been totally rejected, uh, not only by Israel, uh, but also by the United States and by European officials as well, as, as inaccurate, as inflammatory, and maybe even as something anti-Semitic. Um, can you tell us what it means um, uh, to, to use the term apartheid in this context? And, and why is it happening now after, after 55 years of occupation? Um, and what does it mean going forward for, for Israelis and Palestinians? Um, uh, what does Israel's move uh, this week uh, that, we, that we talked about in terms of uh, transferring authorities to, uh, to, uh, in, from the military to civilian uh, bodies, what does that mean in the context of this apartheid framework? Yes, Khaled, I think, um, well, I just want to maybe start by saying that the, the word apartheid maybe has different meanings for different people and rings different bells. In the legal sense, uh, apartheid is a crime in the international uh, legal um, uh, meaning. And it's a crime that is uh, uh, prohibited. It is maybe different than using the word apartheid in political discourses in general. And that's where the, the reports of organizations like Human Rights Watch, of Amnesty International, B'Tseda, Mishdin, and many, many others, including many Palestinians who've used the word before, and Al-Haq issued an excellent also uh, analysis and report about that, you know, centering also the right to self-determination is a crucial component to understanding this uh, situation. Now, Yes, of course, Israel is committing the crime of apartheid, right? Apartheid refers to situations of domination uh, by one group over one ethno-national, in this case, group over another ethno-national group um, uh, under certain circumstances that I think, if you read just the executive summary of these reports, it becomes evident that these uh, conditions are fulfilled and the crime of apartheid in its legal sense is um, um, is 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 committed, right? But this analysis is is one way to say that the situation is really bad, right? Uh, using the word apartheid is one way to say that, uh, and using the word apartheid is one way to say that there are crimes against humanity that are being committed here, that we need accountability, uh, that the international community should intervene, and the apartheid framework is a way to do that because it's a crime that exists in international law. There is a prohibition against apartheid in the international legal system following the case uh, of, of South, South Africa, right? So that's the idea of, of why now after, you know, years and years of occupation uh, in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, it became evident that there is on a one state reality, right? It's a, it's a one state system, uh, a regime that basically controls the lives of Palestinians between the river and the sea, which is growingly a framework of, you know, apartheid, um, and and uh, that's that's I think why eventually this epiphany of, uh, you know, uh, turning, and I think it's a little bit too little, too late at this point, but it's still welcomed, right? Uh, Palestinians have been saying apartheid, have been saying colonialism, settler colonialism, and Francesca uh, issued an excellent report also centering these concepts uh, about the the OPT, right? And so. It is important to understand that, uh, um, you know, the word apartheid refers to this, describes 
the legal situation in this sense, or part of the legal situation. It's not only exhaustive because there is other means to describe it. I want to center again um, the, the concept of self-determination because what is happening also here is in fact the negation of Palestinian self-determination um, and, uh, and it's an ongoing settler colonial project, right? Um, it's, uh, it's basically based on an ideology uh, that is uh, that is uh, a racist ideology that allows you know assigns value to 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 for example Jewish settlers over at the expense at the direct expense of Palestinian ethnic cleansing. Um, so this is in, in total the situation. And as a wrapping up, you know, so what now? Why the states? Why this discrepancy um, between the human rights scene and perhaps state actors? I guess, you know, the answer lies in just understanding uh, or reflecting, for example, comparing to Ukraine. Um, the international community is, is, is unfortunately, when it comes to Palestine, is deeply biased uh, and, and state actors uh, are not taking or they're assuming the role that they should. Uh, assume in these cases when even it's it's clear and there is a consensus as you've said uh, of human rights violations in in Palestine we're still seeing that there is no uh, major action actually dubbing these reports human rights uh, action all uh, as as um, anti-semitic and this is ridiculous I think you know Palestinians have been the people who upheld this distinction between Zionism as a political ideology and project that is colonizing Palestine and between Judaism as a religion or a wider community. And this distinction has been actually blurred by the actions of Israel intentionally, right? Israel is continuously trying to blur these, uh, this distinction and Palestinians have been upholding it, upholding it alongside allies, Jewish non-Zionist, anti-Zionist allies. So, Claiming that describing the situation in Israel or Israeli policies as racist uh, or apartheid as anti-Semitic is, I think, ridiculous. And uh, at Harvard, where I am at, we have seen this manifesting in the affair of Kenneth Roth most recently, um, and that speaks to itself, I think. Thanks, Rabia. And there's there's a lot to dig into there as well. And we've had other other events talking about the anti-Semitism issue and and. Well, we can we can go off for uh, several hours on that. Shawan, I want to come back to you. Um, you said earlier that that you know the the Palestine issue, Palestinian human rights, and Israel accountability. This is the most documented you know case of of human rights violations in history, probably. Um, and and there hasn't been accountability. But I would argue that the Israeli government is, is deeply concerned about this documentation. Um, and the evidence, I would say, that they're deeply concerned about this documentation is the fact that in October 2021, they declared um, seven prominent Palestinian human rights and civil society NGOs, including yours, which again, I'll remind people, is the largest and most important Palestinian human rights organization and one of the oldest human rights organizations in the Arab world. They declared all of you to be terrorist organizations. And in August of last year, they actually went so far as to try to shut down your offices. They, they welded your doors shut and demanded that you cease, cease working, which, which you did not, you are still working. So, so arguably they're concerned about what you're doing. Um, so it must be having some impact. So I'd like you to talk about that. I also wanna point out that all of that was done under the previous government, which was the government of so-called moderates, um, which says something there. And I, I guess if you wanna talk about what is behind these designations as a trend in political thinking that is not limited just to the extremes of Israeli government with this expansive definition of terrorism, which appears to include human rights monitoring and reviewing. And if you also maybe could talk a little bit about what the impact of this assault on the Palestinian human rights sector has been. I mean, you clearly are, you're here, you're speaking and you're still operating, but what, what is that impact um, on your work? Shawan, you're muted still. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, the uh, designation in my point of view are politically motivated to remove us as obstacle in the path of the colonial enterprise and also trying to engineer the Palestinian civil society. But it has only strengthened our resolve. To be honest with you, I'm speaking about al haq we are not providing you know, direct services like maybe other organizations. We are an advocacy organization. We are documenting, we are doing all 
of these things uh, to continue you know, our work. Uh, it has actually been a confirmation of the value and uh, importance you know, of our work. Even after our offices were raided and sealed, we did not miss one day of work <clears throat> and have been fully operational throughout the period of designation. Because work in the human rights field is not a picnic or a job. I think to defend the rule of law and justice, to live in dignity, freedom, and to exercise self-determination and the equality and all of these things, I think deserve all the prices that people and the human rights defenders uh, can pay. There is no such thing as a moderate colonial regime. They have all pursued the same end, just through you know, different means and methods. Uh, for sure, it affects you know, some colleagues here, there, the work that we do, uh, the victims, cases, but we intensified our work. We know that we are doing this and maybe we pay you know, even a personal price, even other prices we don't know how, because still you know, the designation order and the military order, outlawed order of the organization is still as a knife on our neck and they haven't you know, gotten any, any evidence. We couldn't get any evidence just to defend ourselves. Because of that, there is no due process. There is no system, nothing like that. And we live in this situation. Even the, more than that, they couldn't convince any of their friends, including the CIA. We challenged them. We challenged them to approve that. Is that a case of terrorism or something like that? Do you think that they will stay one minute if they know that there is a terrorism or terrorists or anything like that? No, no way, no way to stay one minute, but they have nothing. This is how they use politically the term of terrorism. It's a stick in their hands to kill and to silence you know, the voice of a human rights defenders. This is what they did. We challenged them to approve one thing that they said. And now when it comes to the moderate or center or leftist or rightist, all of them, they are equal when it comes to the Palestinians' rights. What you are seeing these days, for instance, in Tel Aviv and all of these things, the only missing thing is Palestine, occupation, Palestinians' rights, justice for Palestinians. That's the only thing missing, which it means that it's a common it's a common position when it comes to all, all of these political parties, lefts or rightists or, 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 or all of these things. That's, you know, how we read it. We will continue. We are doing our work because this is a faith and it's at the same time. It's not just, as I said, you know, it's just a picnic or a job. No, no, it's not a job. I am defending even the rights of my children of my grandchildren also in the future, which a future that I would like them to live in. This is an issue that we are defending. Thank you. Thanks, Shawan. Um, uh, Francesca, I, I wanted to turn to you and ask, um, obviously as UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the occupied Palestinian territory, your job is to provide an assessment uh, of the human rights conditions on the ground uh, for, for UN officials, for world governments. Um, but that's hard if you're not even allowed to be on the ground. Uh, you have been uh, barred uh, by Israel from entering the country. Um, and at the same time, we've heard from members of Congress and even members of the Biden administration uh, who have attacked you and your work. Can you talk a little bit about um, how that impacts your work and, and what are the broader uh, uh, implications uh, for for uh, for international law uh, as it as it pertains to to human rights in the occupied territories. Yeah, uh, I I find the obstacles to entry the occupied Palestinian territory 
significant because my mandate requires to base my reporting on country visit. The fact that this year, it's not that I was barred, but I was told that I would be given a permit to enter because I, again, I asked, I organized my visit and I asked Israel to facilitate um, without really asking for permission because I will tell you in a minute, I don't think that Israel really has, it doesn't have the sovereign power over the occupied Palestinian territory to give visas, for example. Uh, I find it superbly annoying that everyone treats the occupation as if it was a normal fact of life when it's, I'll tell you, even if the, the, the Israel was a normal occupying power, um, which is not because it acts in bad faith and it acts, out, it acts outside what is permitted by the international law in all possible ways and all possible legal frameworks that we can imagine at the international level. But it has no so territorial sovereignty over the OPT. And, um, and um, it also is in breach of the right of self-determination, as I amply argue and demonstrate in my report. So it's abusing of its powers when it prevents me or any other human rights actors, especially UN officials, from entering the territory, but including uh, determining uh, the freedom of movement of the Palestinians under occupation. It's totally abusive and it should be rejected. So it, as I said, this is an obstacle. The reactions from Israel, the US uh, um, is, uh, is despicable because they never engage with the substance of my report uh, as they have done with the, with my predecessors. Um, and uh, it's even more despicable that they do that on un unfounded um, allegations of anti-Semitism against me. Uh, it's extremely offensive. The allegation of, the accusation of anti-Semitism is very heavy uh, for anyone, and it should be so, but it, it's preposterous. It, in my case, like um, in many of the cases of human rights um, voices accused of anti-Semitism, the conflation between anti-Semitism and, and criticism of Israeli policies, as Rabia has said, it's an engineered move to chill and silence the debate, as well as to shrink the space for discussion around uh, Palestine. Uh, but it's also, um, it responds to the to the uh, to the necessity to deflect attention from the fact that millions of Palestinians in the occupied territory live under an apartheid regime, deprived of basic rights, including, as a, as I mentioned, the right of self determination. And mind you, what's happening to Al Haq and all other organizations um, uh, accused of terrorism is is again an expression of the violation of the right of self-determination because the, these organizations are trying to protect the civic, the civic space in Palestine. And, um, and they are targeted because of this work, which by the way, is part and parcel of maintaining the apartheid framework. And as, as indicated in the, in the convention um, on, uh, on the suppression of the crime of apartheid. Now, um, I want to stress one last point. Um, in, in Europe and North America, many voices, many progressive Jews and others have um, exposed, have denounced this conflation between anti-Semitism and, uh, and uh, criticism of Israeli policies. Uh, bringing up another element of it. This is anti-Palestinian racism, because again, in, in it's the the, the 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 condemnation of any um, of the Israeli practices, as it's also portrayed uh, in the uh, mainstream media, reflects an epistemic violence against the Palestinian, a violence that is expressed in the very way this purported conflict is uh, narrated. Thank you. And, and for folks who are listening, I just also want to clarify, sometimes when people talk about the ability to enter Israel, I mean, it's important to say, I mean, Francesca is talking about the ability to go and visit the West Bank, for example. And I think it's really, it should be emphasized, the, the, the occupation, apartheid, whatever you want to call it, is such that Israel controls who can visit Palestinians because there's no way to travel 
to the West Bank that does not force you to cross an Israeli border stop, whether you're coming from Jordan or you're coming through Ben Gurion Airport, in which case Israel decides who gets to travel. And we saw a case this week of a European, a member of the European Parliament who was trying to travel to visit Palestinians in the West Bank on a diplomatic mission and was stopped at Ben Gurion. And Israel absolutely has the sovereign right, just like any country, to determine who can enter its territory. But because of the the because of what occupation looks like, that means it also gets to decide who can visit the Palestinians. I think it's just, it's something people forget. All right, we're running out of time. I want to do, um, we had questions for each of you in this last round. We have some questions from the audience. I'm gonna just do this as a lightning round. And I'm gonna ask each of you, starting with Francesca, to answer the same question. So this is an event that is aimed at congressional staff. Um, it'll be watched eventually by other policymakers and by the public. I want you to answer the question, what in your view should, in a positive sense, the US be doing? The US Congress, the US administration, and more broadly, what do you think the correct response of the international community is when it comes to um, living up to commitments to international law or commitments to human rights? Um, so Francesca, you go first. We're gonna make these like very short answers. Francesca, Rabia, you're next. And Shawan, you're gonna get the last word. Yes, I'll try to be quick. Three things. So first of all, I think that, uh, that, that there is a need for a paradigm shift in the way the question of Palestine and Israel-Palestine is approached. And the um, this uh, implies serious changes in the way the U.S., approaches the question. Because first of all, a change of language is necessary. I mean, I was I, I regularly follow what um, the US administ or various US administrations say and look at at the recent uh, announcement of settlement expansion. It was called unilateral measures that might undermine the viability of a Palestinian state, excuse me. I mean, is this serious? First of all, they are settlements are not unilateral measures, they are war crimes. And second, this is not a result of this administration. This has happened over 55 years. The very reason why Israel maintains the occupation is to protect the settlements. And this is not just human rights actors saying that. This is the very Israeli civil society saying that, together with the Palestinians, of course. So first and foremost, Add, um, adapt your policies to the facts because you are not protecting Israel. If you look at the, if you link the dots of 55 years of unchecked occupation and the government they have in place right now. Um, the, the, the second thing is that international law my, me, is to be the, the compass to or, orient or reorient politics and not the other way around. Is, is the United States have an obligation to uh, not to recognize the, the legal occupation and not to aid and abet the anything that emanates from it. The US have transferred 150 billion US, US dollars to, 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 to Israel in the past 55 years, not considering the, the aid, which I think amounts to other 50 billion dollars, 3.8 billion every year. So um, currently, so this is this is again. This is not in line what international law recommends. Um, and the third and last thing, um, there is one way only to end violence is to end the this illegal occupation and then the apartheid that it, this occupation has morphed into. And the, in the immediate, um, it's necessary to deploy a protective presence to de-escalate the loss of life in the, in the OPT. This is in the interest of the Palestinians, but also the Israelis, to protect Israeli civilians in Israel, because this is the main explicit concern of Israel, but a protective presence is absolutely necessary now. Rabia, you're next. Yeah, I will just say, you know, three main things. Um, continuing on what Francesca just said, you know, stop funding Israel. I am not asking for much. <laughs> you know, um, we, we don't need the U.S. to continue funding this regime. The bare minimum is three main things to, to at least condition and stop funding this regime, um, to stop vetoing uh, or using the veto power uh, in the Security Council. Again, as I mentioned, 
more than half of the U.S. vetoes ever casted were in favor of Israel. Um, and the third thing is locally, domestically, also stop legislating, for example, against um, uh, or enacting laws such as the anti-BDS laws, right? Um, so these are three bare minimum is to not stifle the movement that is seeking Palestinian justice or justice for Palestinians and liberation. Um, of course, this is the bare minimum. You can expect ideally to move from there to uh, to further uh, um, actions. But if we want to start with something, th this has to be um, uh, the case, you know, not rewarding Israel for the actions and the war crimes it commits. Thank you. And Shawan, you're next. Before you start, I just want to make an addition, which is to say that these are the opinions of our panelists. They're expressing their opinions. The purpose of this webinar is not to advocate for any specific policy or endorse any specific policy. Um, that's that this, this is this is about giving expert expert insights. Um, Shawan, you're up. And you are still muted. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Laura, for this clarification. Uh, the need for international protection force is uh, undeniable, but uh, yes, very unlikely. But we don't want greater military presence. We want to live in peace and with dignity and the ability to pursue our own future. That is the right to self-determination. Uh, this is a colonial enterprise, and with any colonial enterprise, in order for it to come to end, the cost must must uh, outweigh, you know, the benefits of colonial pursuit. Short of the use of force or military presence, sanctions on trade, finance, investment, and military aid are all tools in the toolkit of the international community to use. America alone has the power to change the calculus of this colonial question because it's America tax dollars that to provide billions of dollars in military aid and tens of millions more a year used to directly finance the settlement enterprise under the umbrella of charitable donations through a complex network of so-called charitable organizations benefiting from tax deductible status, taking away tax revenues from the American public and diverting to the commission of war crimes. These cha channels feeding the economic incentive structure, perpetuating the continued colonization of Palestine must be closed off if we really want to see change in behavior. Otherwise, the violence will continue to escalate, blood will continue to be shed if the current situation is not the tipping point for the shift in political will, I am afraid of what it will actually take reach that tipping point, the time for sanction is now. It's time for action. It's time for sanction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shawan. And uh, we are uh, just about out of time now. And uh, so uh, on behalf of the Middle East Institute and the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and on behalf of Laura and me, uh, I want to thank our participants, uh, Shawan, Rabia, Francesca, for uh, a really rich and informative discussion. Uh, and thanks to those of you uh, who joined us um, in our audience uh, and apologies if we didn't get to your questions. Um, we hope that you enjoy, uh, join us again next week for our next session uh, at this same time and same place. Uh, uh, next, sessions, uh, next session will be uh, on um, the subject is, uh, Laura, remind me what the subject is next week. Oops, sir. Next week is free speech and lawfare. Free speech and lawfare, including the anti-boycott um, campaigns going on uh, in, in the US and, and other places. Um, uh, the series, uh, our panelists will include next week, uh, Suhad uh, Baba from Just Vision, Yusuf Munayir from the Arab Center of Washington, and a third panelist uh, to be announced very soon. So thank you all uh, again, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend.